This is a story of creation and a fall. This is a story of a calling. This is a story of slavery. This is the city where I grew up. I know the city. It has a rhythm, it has a personality. It has grievances, scars, and victories. My dad used to drive a truck around these streets delivering coal. Now no one even burns coal anymore. This city has changed. I've changed. At some moment in my life I felt a pull, as though from outside of myself, a gravity that made me want to give my life to helping the city heal and thrive, to become the best city it could possibly be. And it may sound crazy, but I know that that pull came from God. The same God who made me and made this city, and he knows it far better than I do. I was a young man when I felt that pull, or maybe I was younger than a young man, but I heard a call on my life and I answered. I want you to know that I see you when you suffer. I see your ambition and when you are tired. I see you striving, fear and uncertainty. I also see your goodness and your innovation. I see your feats of architecture and intellect. But also your crime. I see you trying to survive here when times are hard and things are against you. I see you raising families here. I see you having fun. I want you to know that I love all of it. I have high hopes for you, and I'm not the only one. Great city, what if every part of you were fully alive? What if there were so much fullness, so much aliveness that it overflowed? What if you were better able to care for your poor, and your centers of business were more able to serve your neighborhoods? And your neighborhoods became better homes for your families and children and your children grew up and began it all again, pouring back into your neighborhoods and your businesses and caring for your poor. What if you, great city, became a place where all people flourished and prospered? I want you to know that you may not know me yet, but I'm a church planner. I've started a church here in this city where you are, where we are together. I believe that the gospel of Jesus Christ is true. I believe he is transforming and renewing humanity. I know he loves the city. That's why I believe these hopes we have for you are possible. And I am not the only one. I am not the only and one. I am not the only one. I'm not the only one. And I'm not the only one. And I am not the only one. And I'm not the only one. Good morning. Welcome to Vintage. My name's uh, Matt. Glad to have you guys. If you're first time guests, welcome. I'm one of the pastors, and I'm so excited just to be with you guys this morning. Uh, we're in a story series right now, okay? And so we've been walking through the whole year. Uh, where we're at today is we are capping off, stopping, finishing the Old Testament section, where we've been looking at uh, God's initiation in people's lives. And so if you have a Bible, uh, if you want to go ahead and open, we're going to be in the story of Ezra and Nehemiah. And we're going to be capping off this Old Testament next week. We want to invite you. We're going to, we're going to start at our United Gathering, Langston and Hughes. We're going to start the New Testament. We're going to go for about three months in the New Testament looking at the stories. But this morning, we're going to be in Ezra and Nehemiah. And we're going to particularly start in uh, Ezra 3. So if you want to turn there in your Bibles, uh, our Connect team is going to pass out some Bibles as well. And here's what we're going to be looking at. I'm 
my goal this morning is to walk you really through all of Ezra and Nehemiah. It's two books in our Bible, but when it was originally written, it, it was one book. It's one story. It's sort of talking about some different men that God worked in. And so it's got great implications for our life. Now, uh, I want, that's what I want to share with you. See, a lot of times we look at this, we go, oh, this is just a bunch of history. It's like history class in school where we read about the rise and the fall of the Roman Empire and read about American history. Well, no, when we come to the Bible, this history is written, inspired by the Holy Spirit to teach us, okay, to, to show us that there's great implications on our life. And so as we dive into this story, I want you to know that what we're looking at has massive implications in our life, Okay. I want to start with a question, and the question is this, what makes a city great? What makes a city great? Maybe you want to write that down, you want to begin to think about that. Um, what makes a city great? I know in saying that, that most likely there's as many answers as there are people, okay? There's, there's a lot of different thoughts about this. I threw this out on Twitter and Facebook this week, and I got a lot of different answers, okay? I got a great city is one that's safe and has jobs. A, a great city's got good education. A, a great city is one that's got a unique culture, okay? A great city is a bike-friendly city. That was one of the answers. A great city is, is one that cares for its people. But I, I want you to think about what makes a great city. What, what makes a, a city great? And depending upon your occupation, depending upon your upbringing, depending on your frame of thinking, that will probably influence your answer. Some of us might say, oh, well, a great city is one that is all similar. Everybody's alike. We all get along. Some people are like, no, it's all about us all being different. There's great strength and diversity some of us might say, you know, I've, I've come to the city and I, I want a good entertainment. I want good music and good events, a great bar, a great club. I want to have a good time. But, but, but I say this question because I believe it's a question that was on the minds of the people that we're going to be looking at today. It, 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 was, it was on the hearts of the people in God's story at this particular time. Okay, these, these people, God's people, weren't in the great city of Jerusalem. They weren't in the city where God's presence was, where God had promised to put them, where God had placed them. No, they were in a different city. They were in a foreign city. And, 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 and we know, because we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, because of their sin, because of their repeated rebellion, God had, had disciplined them, and God had brought the, Babylon, the Babylonian army, and they had taken them into exile. And so you got this people that's in this unique city, this difficult city, and the question is, Maybe not so much what makes a great city, but God, why are you waiting? Maybe that's another question they ask. God, God, why won't you just finish this whole thing? Why won't you just do what, what, what you said you were going to do? And this is where we are in the story. We are in a place where God is waiting. And it's not a waiting like a passive, not doing anything waiting. No, God is waiting actively. We're going we're gonna to see through through some men's lives, through what he does in this community, that, that God's very much alive still. That God's very much still working, and, and in this waiting, he's very much still acting. And so in God's waiting, there's, there's three elements I want us to unpack this morning and learn this morning. The, the first one is this, God's waiting involves him returning his presence. Returning his presence. This is where Ezra starts. It starts in a pretty interesting place. The Persian Empire had taken over the Babylonian Empire, okay? And this Lord, the, the God, the, the one true God, was actually, in fact, stirring in the king's heart of Persia. And he makes this proclamation, a pretty crazy proclamation. It says, all the Jews who are slaves, who are in exile, you're free to go. That's what comes in Ezra 1. You're, you're free to go. You can now go back into Jerusalem. You can go back to that city. You're free to go. An amazing proclamation. In that moment of the proclamation, God begins to raise up a particular leader. His name's Zerubbabel. Maybe you've never heard of him before. I want to tell you a little bit about Zerubbabel, all right? He was a man that I believe was, if you set yourself where he was, I think having grown up in a family, he was a descendant of David. No doubt the stories had come in his family around the dinner table about what happened when God's presence was in the city of God. They, they would have talked with great grandfathers and grandfathers and fathers. We remember the time when God's presence was in Jerusalem. And as a result of that, God began to work through Zerubbabel's prayer life and through his walking with the Lord to really begin to be passionate about seeing the presence of God return to Jerusalem. We know he's so, he's so passionate about it because he begins to rally people. This proclamation comes and he begins to talk around his family, his community group, and his community. And he rallies, as, as Ezra 2 tells us, more than 42,000 people. 
to pack up all their stuff under the new freedom they have to make the trek from Babylon into Jerusalem, some 900 miles. It'd be like us packing up all of our stuff and walking from New Orleans to Chicago, and they make this big old trek across a lot of land, and they enter into Jerusalem. You got the leaders of Rebbebel leading the people into Jerusalem, and they hit a city that is completely destroyed. I want to I set the context for you of, of this city. Remember, the Babylonians had come in. Maybe, maybe it's to help you, we'll refer back to what happened in our city just a few years ago, the, the Katrina. Show some of these pictures of Katrina and, and think about the devastation that was in this city, right? The, the flood had broken the levees. We had the Superdome flooded. We had people walking around. We, we had these homes that were completely moved off foundations. There was, there was ruin all over this city because of the floods. It was destruction here when the first people returned to New Orleans. I want you to know, though, it wasn't just a natural disaster that Zerubbabel and the people were entering back into. It was a destroyed city by an army. So to maybe set the context better, think about what we see on the news of the Syrian conflict. Show some of those pictures of where homes are burned out, where, where people are displaced, where, where a nation is devastated. Businesses are burned out. This, this, this is the context that, that Zerubbabel and the people, this first wave of exiles of about three waves, enter into a city. And they enter in, and let's look in Ezra 3, verse 1, at what they begin to do. It says, When the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in their towns. The people gathered as one man to Jerusalem. Then arose Jeshua, the son of Zorak, with his fellow priests, and uh, Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, with his kinsmen, and they built the altar of the God of Israel. They offered burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. They set the altar in its place, for fear was on them because of the people of the land. And they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, burnt offerings morning and evening. The leader Zerubbabel leads the people into a destroyed city. That's the context, and they begin in a, a pretty unique way. They don't begin by rebuilding a wall. They don't begin by rebuilding homes. No, they come in and they, they scrape off sort of maybe the temple mound where the temple had been, where the presence of God had been, and they set up an altar. They, they enter in. They say, God, we're, we're going to have a worship service to you. As, as a community, very similar to how Abram entered this land so many years ago, we're going to set up an altar, and they begin to worship, and they say, Lord, we want your presence to return back here. This, this is a significant thing happening in the life of Israel, in the, the life of this city. They returning, and what they're doing in setting up this altar is it's a, it's a bold statement of faith that they're making upon with God. They're saying, God, we want your presence to come back. God, we want you to restore your covenant with us that, that you made so long ago. God, we want you and your presence to be in our lives. They were, they were seeking the presence of God, and God returned it. Pe people, people were changed. They, they were changed by beginning to see the calling that they had. This nation was a distinct nation, right? We've talked about this. They had been placed in that land for a reason. <clears throat> They'd been given a calling to be a, a royal priesthood. They had been blessed, not just to be blessed, but to bless others. And the role of Israel, the, the purpose of this people was to be a distinctive nation in all the other nations. And they, they regain this. <clears throat> they also become very dependent upon the Lord. They, they've got a broken down city. They've got a destroyed city. They, they know they could be wiped out real easily. This isn't an army, it's a, it's a people. And they say, God, we want your presence. Not only do we want, our, we want to live out our calling, but God, we, we want to be dependent upon you. We, we need your presence in our lives to live, to operate, to not be destroyed again. We need your presence in our lives. And I think as we look at this picture, as we, as we think about this story, I think it gives us a powerful implication of what spiritual awakening can do in someone's life. Let us, let us not devalue what God can do when his presence awakens in someone's life. Men, women, 
the impacts are upon, yes, ourselves. It is, yes, on our marriages, yes, on our families, but it is also on our community and our city. This is the story of Zerubbabel. This is the lesson that comes from some of his life is the idea that God awakened in his life. He rallied a people to return and to seek after the presence of God to seek after it, to long after it, to fast after it, to say, God, we need you. God, we've been called. God, we have our identity. God, we are dependent solely on you and your presence dwelling in our life. And so I want to ask you this morning just a simple question, but have you ever examined your life? Maybe this morning you examine your life, and can I ask you, do you experience the presence of God in your life? Are, are you, like Zerubbabel, one who seeks after that and prays towards that? Are you, are you one that around the dinner table with your family are talking about how God is present in our life? Are we noticing that? Are we being sensitive to that? Are we, are we listening to the voice that's leading us, how, how the Holy Spirit maybe might be in our life and leading us? Are we sensitive to that presence? Do we want that presence? See, I think that's the lesson that comes from Zerubbabel is in the destroyed city, He needed the presence of God so badly, so, so badly. So God's waiting first, uh, the first element of this is that he returned his presence. He returned his presence. But secondly, God's waiting also involved him rebuilding his city, him rebuilding his city. Okay, Zerubbabel will spend about 20 years of his life rebuilding the altar and the temple. And then there's about 60 some years that pass. A man named Ezra comes. We're not gonna talk about Ezra, but he's sort of like the teacher preacher. He comes over, he's the second wave of exiles. He begins to sort of fan into flame more of this spiritual awakening. And then there's a third man. There's a third man that, that God begins to work in his life and begin to grow and to lead. His name's Nehemiah. Nehemiah is the next book, if you wanna turn over there. And we see at the beginning of Nehemiah that Nehemiah is working, um, he's a government worker in, in Persia. He's working for the king, and so he's got a job. He, he was Jewish, but he, he didn't return with any of those other exiles or anything like that. He was working under a king, and his brother did return to the land. His brother returned to Jerusalem and was living in the city, and he, for whatever reason, he makes a big visit over into his brother Nehemiah in, in Persia, and he brings him a report. And the report comes back that Nehemiah, there's, there's a great church there. The temple's back. The, the presence of God's there. But, but Nehemiah, the city's still broken. The, the walls are still broken down. Nehemiah, this is, this is a terrible state for this city to be in. In the same way that God led Zerubbabel to be, to be concerned for the city, Nehemiah becomes concerned in, in, a, in a different way. What we're going to see is that this, this leader, Nehemiah, is being raised up and, and, and being given this passion, this heart that breaks for the city for a different role, for a different reason, in a different way that God makes cities great. He, he begins to pray and ask the Lord, Lord, what's my role? Lord, I, I hear the brokenness of this city and it breaks my heart. Lord, I'm concerned for Jerusalem. This is where my people are from. This is where my family's from. Lord, what's my role in that? And the Lord says, go to the king and ask him to send you, paying for your way to go back and rebuild this city. You're gonna be the man that's gonna organize some of this massive rebuilding work. Crazy thing is it worked. God told him, he went and asked, and the king has great favor. God had given him great favor in the king's eyes, and the king says, I'll do it. So Nehemiah rallies up the third of the massive waves of exiles, and they return back, and they don't return like Zerubbabel into a destroyed city. It's a, it's a different city now. It's a, it's a broken city, okay? It's a vulnerable city. What this means is that what they return into is a city, yes, that people are living in, but they're not fully living. They're, they're not fully thriving in, in relationship and in this community and in this city. And, and Nehemiah enters. He enters into this city and he begins to work. Now to, now to set the context of what he's working on, I want to show you a diagram and I want to walk you through a diagram. This diagram is called the Four Foundational Relationships. A man named Dr. Myers um, made this diagram, and it's really helpful for us to understand what, what Nehemiah is about here, okay, what Nehemiah is working on. There is this reality that God has created every single one of us to exist, okay, in four foundational relationships, right? I want to walk you through these. This is a picture of them. You can see those. You can draw that if you want or whatever like that, but here's the relationships, right? God and man is the first one. 
The, the reality is, this Bible tells us, this is our primary relationship. What this means is that through this relationship, all other of our relationships flow out of this. Everything in our life flows out of our relationship with God and man. Okay? In creation, God as a father, think of as a father, created sons and daughters. And the purpose of that was for us as sons and daughters to know him, to serve him, to love him, to glorify him. He's our father. We're his sons and daughters. That's that relationship. God also created a relationship between man and self. Is this idea, the Bible tells us that each of us had been created in God's image. What this means is that every one of you sit here and have great value upon your life. You have great dignity in who you are. You have great worth upon your life because God created you in his image. He sees your relationship with yourself with great worth, great value, great dignity. Third relationship is our relationship between man and others. Not only did God create us in his image but to, to, to have worth, but also he created us to be relational. God is in perfect community right now with God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When he created us, he created us in the same way, to be in relationship. What this means is that we know each other, we love each other, we encourage each other, we serve each other. We were created to exist in relationship. This is what God created. And then the final one is between man and creation. Is this idea that God not only created us to be in relationship, but he created us with work to do. We were called, we were given work to be stewards of the creation he had made. This means that we are called, like him, to be engaged with creation, to be engaged and to understand and to manage and to interact with creation. Creation are the public schools in our city. It's the music that's being written. It's the governments that rule and reign that are established. It's the businesses that we all work in. It's the culture within which we sit in. This is creation, and our call is not just to be in relationship, but it's to begin to steward and to work within creation. That's that relationship. And this picture that you see up here is of perfect unity. It's, it's, it's at the creation of everything when it was all great, Genesis 1 and 2. What we know is that Genesis 3 happened, and, and sin enters the picture, and, and what we call this is the fall. As, as a result of this fall, as a result of sin, what the Bible tells us is all four of these relationships have now been broken. They, they've now been broken. The, 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 the fall created a brokenness in all these relationships. Now at church, we talk a lot about this in the regards to man and God, right? There is this reality that there is a pot, there's a brokenness now of spiritual intimacy, there's this, there's this break between God and man, and this is in some ways what Zerubbabel was working towards in Ezra 3, okay? He's working to bring back, to restore back a, a spiritual intimacy with God and man. But, but what I want you to know is that the fall was so comprehensive that it affected every other relationship. It, 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 it brought up with ourselves a, a brokenness of being. It's the idea that some of us maybe sit here this morning and we struggle with our identity of who we are. We, we struggle with our self-esteem. It's because we're living right now in a state of brokenness within our being of who we are, and we don't know who God really made us to be. There's, there's a brokenness between man and others. There's this, this brokenness of community, of what we call it. As a result of this, we, we see people be abused. A manifestation of this is alive in our city in, the, in regards to murder, people taking other people's lives. That's, that's a brokenness of community. There, there's a brokenness that also shows out in divorce. Marriage is ending. Families being broken. This, this, this is that brokenness that results because of sin in our lives. And then the final one is a brokenness of stewardship. It is that at times we can, we can lose our purpose as stewards, as ones who have been called to interact and engage with culture. We, we can lose our purpose. And see, what this diagram does is it helps us to see the comprehensiveness of the fall and the effects that it had. The effects of the fall are not just spiritual, but they also are social. There is this reality that the fall has impacted both the spiritual and the social lives of every single one of us and every single one in our city. And I bring this out because this is what Nehemiah begins to address. Nehemiah enters, and in Nehemiah 3, if you want to turn there and look, he begins to rebuild the wall. He, he, he begins, and he comes, and he rallies these people together, and he says, we're going to rebuild this city. 
God, God's going to work through us. We're going we're to rebuild this city. He says, guys, we're going to focus on the physical and the social needs of this community. We're going to focus in on the physical and the social needs of this city. That, that's what we're going to be about. And so they begin to, to work on the wall. And, and, and Ezra, I mean, Nehemiah 3 is so cool. It's, it's like a whole family. You've got all these men and women and their, their moms and dads and, and sons and daughters all working together to rebuild this place. They, they meet opposition and uh, they continue on through it. The end of Nehemiah 6, if you want to turn over there, they see the wall finished. They complete this work. They've rebuilt this place. And then we want to turn over to Nehemiah 12. Nehemiah 12 is the dedication of their work. It's a ceremony they have to commemorate all that God has done with them in rebuilding this city. And here's what it says in Ezra 12, I mean, in Nehemiah 12, 43. And they offered great sacrifices that day and, and rejoiced for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and the children also rejoiced and the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. Love that. The, the, the city's rebuilt, the, the people are now more protected, the people are now more cared for, they can now live more in a vibrance of life and, and, and thrive. The, the city is rebuilt, and as a result of that, joy comes. And who brings it? The Lord. The Lord, in what they've done and how they've worked together to rebuild the city, brings joy in these people and in this place, and it fills up so much that it overflows and it's heard far away. That this joy that comes from the Lord is filling them up and it's beginning to splash over into the other communities and other contexts in their region. See that. See that, that Nehemiah leads the people to rebuild, to address physical and social needs in their city. The result of that is people experience joy. The city is, is a joyful place. This is why I like reading Nehemiah. Uh, Nehemiah, I've been in for about the last two years of my life. Um, this, is, this is where God just continues to take me back, Ezra, Nehemiah, Ezra, Nehemiah. And the reason I, I love it so much is because what it's done in my life is it has widened my scope. Now, as, as a Christian, as a Christian living in a city, living in a community, living in relationship, it has taken and it has, it has widened my scope. What, what, what Nehemiah does for me, I think, and I think what it does for all of us is it, it deepens the gospel. I want to explain what I mean here by this. Again, our proclivity as, as the church, general church, is to focus only on God and man's relationship and, and that brokenness that's there and that restoring that needs to happen there. I'm a pastor. I believe in that, okay? I want, I want that to know, okay? I'm, I'm not diminishing that. I'm not, I'm not taking that down. But what, what Nehemiah does and his role and the way he lived, it, it takes and it begins to deepen the gospel in new ways. We see that, there's also other relationships. There's physical and social implications to how we as Christians should live and how we as the church should interact. A deepened gospel, what we understand, is actually a gospel that transforms every single area of the life, every area of our city. Not, not just the spiritual area of our city, but the physical, the social, the educational. Those areas of our life are transformed by the gospel as well. This is amazing. This is what Nehemiah teaches us. People, yes, need to hear the gospel preached to them, but people also need to be loved by the gospel. People, yes, need to, need to hear about their communities and their need for Jesus, but our communities also need to be places where we as believers are infusing the gospel in every area of that community. This is what Nehemiah does. It gives us this more holistic approach to our lives. It helps us to see that it's not just, we're not just here to, to send everyone to heaven and, and propagate heaven. We, we are. That's, that's a huge part of the church. We're also here to disciple people and grow people and to see them fully thrive in life as God intended it. Th this is what Nehemiah does to us. And this is Nehemiah's call. It's a different call than Zerubbabel. It's a different role in Zerubbabel, but he had a unique way. He had a unique, unique call. He was an average guy. His call in his life was also the same, was to a people, to a city, led by God. And what's interesting is the difference between Zerubbabel and Nehemiah are not much. Zerubbabel and the work that God uses him leads to a spiritual awakening, and the same happens within Nehemiah. His work in the city leads to a spiritual awakening. People being grown in their city and developed in their life and and seeing all that God intended for those four relationships begin to be lived out. See, God used Nehemiah, the leader, and a people to 
rebuild his city. So God not only returned his presence, he not only rebuilt his city, but the final element is the idea that God re- renewed his people. God renewed his people. You see, there's hundreds of years that continue to sort of pass, and, and, and in some ways this building of the temple and the building of a city actually became more of the focus than God. And ultimately it left this question that's been resonating in our time as we walk through the Old Testament since Genesis and Genesis 3. There's a need for God to bring the ultimate solution. That there's a need in our lives, and it's been reverberating since Genesis 3 in the fall. We need Jesus. And so in God's renewal, he eventually one night births a leader. It's a, just like Zerubbabel and Nehemiah, a seemingly insignificant man born to a teenage mom in a small little town. His name was Jesus. And this, this man grows up, he follows God, and Jesus becomes the full fulfillment of everything that we've been reading about in the Old Testament. Everything that Zerubbabel looked towards in the presence of God and everything that Nehemiah worked towards in the rebuilding of the city all find its ultimate fulfillment in Jesus. And this this man grew up and he begins to renew people. He, He begins the work that God has called him to, which is to renew and to restore and to redeem all of creation. Matthew 9.35 tells us this, gives us a summary of how Jesus did this a little bit. It says, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. Like, like Nehemiah, like Zerubbabel, Jesus lived in the same way. The, the, the complete fulfillment comes that he sees them and he has compassion on them and he knows that they're harassed and helpless, as it says, like sheep without a shepherd. And he rallied his group of people, the ones he was leading, his disciples, and he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. You see, Jesus' life and his ministry and his message focus and address both the spiritual and the physical needs in people's lives. Jesus begins to live out exactly how God wants us to live, which is to begin to be about renewing this people, all people, all the world, all the creation. He begins to live that out. Ultimately, it led to his death. Unlike Nehemiah's rubble, he was killed for what he did. He went to a cross, and maybe we know that, but on the cross, what happened was God, through Jesus, redeems all of those relationships. Our relationship with God, our relationship with ourself, our relationship with others, our relationship with creation, all of that's redeemed in Jesus. And he's dead and he's buried. And three days later, he walks out of the grave. He rises again. And he rallies this group of people together, about the size of this room right here, 120 people. And he says, God's at work. God started something with my life and my ministry and what God is starting is renewing of people, renewing of cities, renewing of neighborhoods, renewing of communities. And he says, guys, here's the cool thing. The heavenly father invites you to get in the work with him. Wait, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's gonna scatter you. And and, and you're gonna begin to be agents of change. You're gonna begin to take the gospel into places that have never known about the goodness of God, the greatness of God, and the redemption that God offers. You know what's crazy? You flip over to Acts, it actually happened. It actually happened. The, the, The people, this small little group of disciples understood that they were agents of change, that God was sending them, that God was inviting them in to enjoy him with his, enjoying him with the work. And they begin to scatter all throughout cities and villages just like Jesus did. And they begin to proclaim the good news. They begin to heal people. They begin to care for sick. They begin to be called Christians. That word comes because those people live so much like Jesus. Didn't have derogatory term back then. It was a great thing that Christians were in your city. I want you to think about this. The Christians came and they lived as Jesus lived in their city. They they came and they... They cared for people just like Jesus cared for people. They, they loved as Jesus had loved people. They, they lived and they welcomed people as Jesus had welcomed people. And because of that, they were called Christians. Secular historians said that Christians were the souls of their community. 
They, they lived with such a distinctness and such a difference within which everyone else lived that they were noticed for what they were doing. It was, it was crazy. The gospel is crazy. The, the gospel began to work through these people and it multiplied rapidly. As we pray as vintage it does, the gospel multiplied in Acts and throughout the world through this church and through Jesus' group of disciples. And it was different because when they came into a city, what they brought was life and vibrance they shared that Jesus' presence or God's presence could be with us, that the rebuilding of a city could happen, and he could renew all people. Man, I, I love hearing how God's worked. I love reading Old and New Testament that, that the church was used in such an amazing way, particularly the New Testament. And now I come to this place where I'm one of your pastors and and, and I pray that we would be used in the same way. I, I pray that, that we would see God use us to make our city great and cities all over the world great. That's the question. What, what makes a city great? I, I believe it involves people experiencing great joy spiritually. It involves redemption. It involves them being renewed by Jesus in spiritual life. It also involves, though, a, a, a city that's great also involves people experiencing great joy physically and socially, educationally, financially. It, it, it involves people experiencing the fullness of peace that is offered to them in Jesus and in the church loving their community. It, it involves a fullness of life and a thriving of life that comes because Christians are there. It's, it, there's a distinctness of how we're sent from this place here in about 30 to 45 minutes that we live differently and it changes everything. And so I, I ask a question. I, I close with, with one question I want you to think about. And it is this, where has God placed you to join him in his work in your city? Zerubbabel knew this and he began to live in that way. Nehemiah knew this and began to live in this way. Jesus knew this and began to live in this way. The disciples, the early church, the church historically knew this and began to live in that way. We have hospitals because Christians were so passionate about health care. We have schools because Christians were so, so passionate about education. We have governments because Christians were so, power, were so passionate about justice and God's justice being in a place. We have developed communities, we have parks, we have these type of things we can involve in because we as well are passionate about God's gospel, yes, spiritually, but also physically and socially. And so I ask you, you seeing that God's inviting you this morning into, into his work, he's offering an invitation, I ask that you'd take it. I ask this week you'd live differently in light of this story and in light of who Jesus is in every aspect, in every area of your life. He, he has some great things he wants to use for every single one of us, and that's, that's God's call to us this morning. And so I just want to close our time by simply praying over us in this way. I want to pray for you as a people, as individuals, as families, that Jesus would send us out, and Jesus would use us to, to live the gospel, to love the city, and to be the church, to be distinct, to make an impact. So we pray with me, Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for men and women and families that you have worked in and, and you've used in such amazing ways where we can read history and Lord, it can, it can impact our lives in such powerful ways. And Lord, we look right now where you've placed us and what you've given us and the opportunity and, and Lord, we thank you for your goodness and in, in inviting us to join you in your work. It's like, a son going to, to work with their dad or a daughter going to work with mom or dad. It's you saying, come and join me in, in what's, what's working and how I'm working and what I'm doing in, in cities and communities and neighborhoods and people's lives. Lord, I pray for a, a different perspective on our lives this week. I pray for a, a difference in how we look at people. Lord, I, I pray we'd see our job as a different place, a place where you're working and we're coming to meet you there with how you're working. We'll look as we enter now out of lunch and into our own communities of looking about entering those communities in a different way with people that, Lord, you are working in. Father, you are, you are alive and your spirit's all over our region. And so, Lord, we pray you'd send us. 
You send us into the, every crevice and area and aspect of our city in order to be distinct, to be Christian, to be unique, to, to bring the message of the gospel in the life of the gospel and the ministry of the gospel with our hands and our feet and our mouth. Lord, let us speak and Lord, let us serve the way you did. Let, let, us, let us be called little Jesuses as those early Christians were. God, we love you, we thank you, and we ask that you do all of this by your power, for your glory, in your son Jesus' name, amen.